hope everyone is doing good today. Um, today we are going to talk about science fiction. It's so sad that we haven't had the chance to discuss science fiction at all in our group on MS Team. However, I believe science fiction is for you the most familiar genre of popular literature. At least if you haven't read it from uh, novels or short stories, you are very familiar with the genre from TV series, movies, and um, many other forms of uh, entertainment, basically, games, songs, and so on. That's why uh, what I think we need to check for now is the basic theory of science fiction. And hopefully by knowing them in reality, by knowing works of science fiction more than any other genre, you are now ready to make a connection between those works and the theories that underlie the science fiction genre. And uh, for that, let me show you uh, some uh, slides over here that uh, hopefully can accompany you in uh, reviewing the genre. And uh, if you have read the module, you might know that uh, this, uh, this PowerPoint is actually a, a somewhat a summary of the, the module that I have given you uh, earlier this semester. And uh, you have read earlier uh, the four science fiction works. Uh, you might have read only two, that's fine. Uh, and you will try to make the connection between those works and the theories that I am now going to tell you. All right, first of all, uh, when we talk about science fiction, we need to realize that, like everything else, science fiction as a genre has evolved, okay? What we know as science fiction has not always been like that since the past. And uh, for me, there are four generations of science fiction. And here, when we say uh, four generations of science fiction, it doesn't mean that all of them are like what we know now as science fiction. Some of the earlier definitions of science fiction actually can be confused with fantasy. In fact, science fiction and fantasy are often not separated. I once took a course on Coursera that is entitled Science Fiction and Fantasy because those two are often together in the past when the technology was not like now, what worked better for people for the same purpose of science fiction now is fantasy, all right? So uh, in the four generations, the first one is the, the pre-19th century science fiction. And it is mostly uh, a work of fantasy with uh, a little bit of science. But the main, the main themes of these works are about uh, the importance of the journey and the the exploration of fantasy and so on. Uh, basically, things were related to travel. We know now uh, works like uh, Caliber's Travels. I will show you the image soon. And uh, Utopia by Thomas More. These two works are often related to uh, science fiction. When uh, Frederick Jameson discusses science fiction, he keeps referring to Thomas More's uh, Utopia. And during the 19th century, when uh, the Industrial Revolution took place, the works of science fiction showed a different flavor, a different tendency. Now, the tendency of this kind of science fiction is responding to the Industrial Revolution, responding to the the fear that industrial revolution or machines can cause us. And that's what we have found in the science fiction works of the 19th century. And during late 19th century and earlier, uh, early 20th century, we saw works of science fiction that are not only responding to the industrial revolution, but to the scientific enlightenment. What we believe as the progress of humankind thanks to human uh, humans cognition humans reason are questioned here then uh, we will find 
uh, examples in the work of uh, H.G. Wells or uh, many others. We will discuss uh, those works later. And later on, during the late uh, 20th century, uh, we are, of course, we still love industrial, uh, not industrial, technology. Yeah, but the kind of technology that we are now dealing with is something different. It's no longer about heavy machineries, but it's more about computers or the the tendency of computer that can uh, cause harm to others. For example, by uh, the creation of artificial intelligence. Okay. We are now uh, familiar with the idea of artificial intelligence, but people from the late 60s, they already, well, the, the sensitive ones the science fiction writers of uh, that era, they felt that something is coming, something unusual about computer is coming. And uh, one of the works that we are now still celebrating is the 2001 Space Odyssey, uh, which, which is a movie now, by uh, Stanley Kubrick. In the movie, you will see how uh, a person deals with machine and the, the kind of uh, decisions that machines make. All right, now let's show you some pictures. This is uh, the image, well, not from not from Gulliver's Travel, but an adaptation of Gulliver's Travels in uh, the modern era. As you can see, the sneakers are are not sneakers from the 19th century like uh, Gulliver's Travels, right? But the idea is that it is about uh, a giant. Uh, a person, man size, or a normal sized person going into a place where people are smaller. Okay, and during the 19th century, which I mentioned to you, uh, has science fiction that respond to technology. We have this uh, work called 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea by Jules Verne, uh, a French writer. Jules Verne's, uh, Verne talks about a person called Captain Nero, who leaves the society, Captain Nemo, sorry, who leaves the society and decides to live in a submarine. That's uh, the the novel is set in a uh, mid 19th century. Back then, the submarine technology was not as huge as it is now, and uh, world travel was still limited when it comes to explorations to uh, the, the bottom of the sea. But here in the novel by, um, by Jules Verne, we see a captain with his crew traveling around the world in a submarine and he goes to many places that uh, we, uh, I mean humans back then couldn't imagine traveling to, like the Antarctica or uh, making a cross from the Red Sea to the Mediterranean, Mediterranean Sea, and that's before uh, people made the Suez Canal. Okay, and uh, late 19th century, there's also work by H.G. E. Wells, and where there are a lot of works by H.G. E. Wells, and one of them is this, uh, the one about uh, the one called the Island of Dr. Moreau. It's about a doctor who makes experiments to uh, develop humans from animals. So this is also uh, one of the late 19th century or early 20th century, which responds to the, the, the fear or the horror that uh, scientific enlightenment can bring us. Okay. And now what we have in the 20th century uh, is a collection of science fiction works that talk a lot about, for example, uh, artificial intelligence, about robots that uh, can make decisions. And in the beginning of this slide, I showed you an image from uh, Ex Machina. Uh, it's about a robot that can absorb knowledge from around the world and eventually can become uh, more powerful than humans, even the humans that create the robot. Okay, and now, what 
is the definition of science fiction then? If we already have seen all of those stages in the development of science fiction. So, uh, it is not easy to really pin down the definition of science fiction into one or another because there are so many variations and uh, through time, as you know, there are uh, different ways of us creating science fiction and for that purpose, I prefer to call science fiction what the writer calls science fiction, okay? Many things can be included in this section, okay? However, however, uh, if we want to find some kind of common ground, it is the fact that those works use some kind of scientific advancement scientific advancement in its age, okay? If it is, uh, if it was written in the 19th century, then the scientific advancement that uh, the science fiction uses is the one that was present in the 19th century. And, and uh, finally, not only now, the scientific advancement, but the scientific method, the scientific method of presenting something and when it comes to scientific method, what I'm referring to here is that when you believe something to be scientific, then it can be replicated in another place. And it has to go through a certain stages. And it has to uh, go through the same uh, set of reason. And when I'm talking about this last one, I'm referring to works that are not, that actually do not have actual elements of technology, but the principles of technology are practiced there. The ones by uh, Ted Chiang that I showed you are works like that, uh, works that do not necessarily show scientific advancement in the sense that uh, you can see, but it uses scientific method in presenting the idea. And another famous writer from Argentina is um, Jorge Luis Borges. Uh, Jorge Luis Borges also uses this. He doesn't show the uh, technological advancement, but he follows the method of science in presenting his stories. All right. And now we will go to some important concepts that uh, hopefully will give us a better idea of what science fiction is and what differentiates science fiction from other works that might include technology. Okay, so the first notion will be uh, cognitive estrangement and the second one will be novum. The last one is utopia, utopianism, dystopia. These are things that uh, I believe you are not familiar, especially just utopia and dystopia. But what about cognitive estrangement? What is it? If you uh, break this term down into its uh, components, we can say that cognition or cognitive is related to uh, our attempt to uh, make sense of something. While estrangement, it is actually an old um, an old concept in literature in which the writer tries to make the reader not familiar with something and then explaining it, okay? Now, uh, when it comes to uh, science fiction, estrangement here uh, refers to the process of making something familiar become unfamiliar, unfamiliar. Now, put together cognitive estrangement, what does it mean? So uh, we can say that it is a process of creating the sense of strangeness to the readers. However, the strangeness is consistent with a certain reason or logic that is followed by the writer. So there is a logic that underlies the strange thing, right? So what you see is something unusual something weird, something strange, but for some reason, it makes sense. The connection between one part and, the, and another part uh, makes sense, so you can accept it. Now, how do uh, writers achieve this? What they do is creating 
what we call NOFUM. NOFUM is something new introduced to the movie that makes other unusual things or other uh, incredible things believable. What? How does this work? It's usually by creating some kind of or tweaking the logic of uh, the laws of physics in the story. However, the tweaking is done in a, in a consistent way. Now, uh, to take an example, I have shown you here the image from uh, Jurassic Park. In the Jurassic Park, uh, people create dinosaurs from uh, the DNA of mosquitoes. Now, in the movie, they introduced a new element. What is the new element? They introduced the element that we can extract the DNA from mosquitoes trapped in amber. In reality, however, the DNA, well, it doesn't survive to this age. We know uh, a lot of mosquitoes trapped in amber. Sometimes people use them as uh, as a pendants for their necklace. But it is impossible to get the DNA from that mosquito. Now, in the story, they tweak that logic so that it is possible to get the DNA from there. And with that tweak logic, eventually what comes in the story become uh, believable. Now, uh, another another example is a newer one. In the movie, The Black Panther, we can see so many incredible things in the country called Wakanda. People cannot believe something like that can happen in the world if it were in the real world, right? However, in the story, there is a tweak of the logic. What is the tweak? It's the fact that there was a meteor back a million years ago that hit the earth, especially in that area of, in that part of Africa. That um, meteor and its minerals, which is called vibranium, it somewhat pollutes everything else in that area from the water, the plants, and so on. And it gives the Wakandan a lot of uh, minerals that can be used either as protection because it's hard, either as a power source like lithium. And uh, the, the pollution of that mineral into the plants can be used to empower like legitimate leaders to be more powerful than others. So vibranium over there is the tweak logic the presence of vibranium which is not present in the real world it makes all of the story uh, relatable and uh, the last notion is a set of utopian uh, sorry is utopia utopia it's um, neologism a new term uh, invented by sir thomas more in uh, his book utopia which actually talks about a country beyond there, beyond your imagination, a happy place that you cannot reach. Okay. Now, in science fiction, utopia basically means a very ideal place, a good place that uh, we do not have it now. And you have a lot of uh, science fiction works that show utopianism, utopia. Uh, in, in these works, you may find some place in the future that has like flying cars and that has technology that make people interact well and so on. However, when we talk about utopia, usually it often comes with uh, the flip side, which is dystopia. So dystopia in uh, science fiction can be in the form of uh, a technology that has been so advanced, so great, but it eventually, uh, what? Eventually, it it traps human being. Uh, one of the best examples 
is the the novel uh, called A uh, Brave New World by Aldous Huxley. Aldous Huxley talks about a world in which humans do not need to reproduce biologically because reproduction through biological method can lead to um, unanticipated results. We cannot guess uh, what kind of babies we will have if we uh, reproduce biologically. So in this novel, the world decides to uh, reproduce human through uh, cloning, through, uh, through the use of, uh, what, what do you call it? Through the use of um, cells, human cells, and, and they control the process of uh, preparing the, the embryo, the fetus, until it becomes babies. And since the beginning, you will see that uh, an embryo will lead to high quality mankind. So it's the alpha class. And this embryo eventually leads to, uh, to uh, second quality mankind, the, the beta or gamma and so on. I cannot tell you the details for this. Uh, I read it last year and I think I have to refresh it. But basically, the highest quality of person is uh, a person that has no likeness. If one person is unique, there is none. There is none other like this person. Then this is the alpha alpha man or alpha human. And some people are reproduced like in mass production. So you will find uh, the the delta people, a group of delta people. Okay. They look similar, they talk, uh, basically they behave in a similar way. Now, it looks like an advancement of technology, right? The city is so uh, so beautiful with uh, people traveling using, you know, flying cars and everything is prepared. You can watch TV and you can get the aroma of what you see on TV and so on. However, in this world, People do not allow emotions. Why? Because emotions, according to the logic of the industrial logic of the society, the emotion lead to things that you cannot anticipate. So uh, let's kill the emotion by taking some kind of pills, right? So what I wanted to say here is that the idea of utopianism and dystopianism are often inseparable. There are, of course, uh, stories that are purely dystopian, like the uh, zombie stories or like the uh, post-apocalyptic novels. These works are purely dystopian uh, imagination, but some have the combination between utopian and dystopian. Now, for Frederick Jameson, in a work of science fiction, what is important is not really the utopia, but the utopian impulse, impulse the, the tendency towards utopia. When something is in a very bad situation, like in dystopian novels, there are usually points at the end of the novel that shows utopian impulse, shows the sign that things will get better. Just like if our world now is a dystopian uh, reality with, with this uh, COVID-19, then the utopian impulse will lie in the fact that nature is healing. Nature is regenerating itself. The, the holes in the ozone are, are patched now. For example, uh, if we use our life as an example. So that's the utopian uh, impulse, not really a change of situation, but the hope that there will be a change of situation. Now, these are what I want you to explore later on when you find uh, science fiction works. And now I want to relate this new notion of science fiction that has cognitive estrangement, novum, and eventually the idea of utopian and dystopianism with 
what you read earlier. You read a story called The Bell, and one of you asked me, is it really a horror story? Isn't it a work of science fiction? Why? Because uh, in your opinion, there is a technology there. There's a, a house that can take care of the people living in it. Now, most people might think so, and it is okay to think so. However, if we follow the new definition of science fiction in which there has to be a novum, something new that tweaks the logic that makes it possible for something incredible to be happening, we will say that this work does not have that element. This work, the belt, in fact, doesn't really tell us where it comes from and how it can do that. All we know is just like a mystery. All of a sudden, the house decides that it wants to take care of the children. And what that's what makes the story more like a horror story than a science fiction work. It works by the logic of an, a mysterious thing happening. It is even closer actually to the notion of a, say, a gothic house. A house that uh, is like a character that captures the people uh, in it. Now, is the belt in that, if you see from that perspective, looks exactly more like a, a horror story than uh, a science fiction work. It lacks the no film. Now, when you watch a science fiction movie or if you read a science fiction work or works that include technology, now try to see whether you have this no film in there or not. Now, finally, is that all? Is that all that we have to say about uh, science fiction, cognitive estrangement, and novel and utopia? No. I want to end this uh, PowerPoint with this presentation with the notion that according to uh, critics, science fiction is the most political work in literature, in popular literature. And uh, if we include movies, uh, contemporary movies as popular literature, we can say that Science fiction is the most political work. Why so? Because in the process of it creating an estrangement, it likes to question the authority, question the, the status quo of this age. It questions the power of the, for example, the, the government, the power of corporations, the power of religion. They like to question that and flip the logic and create something to the opposite of it. That's why it's interesting to see, for example, Wally, and we see it from the perspective. What does it subvert? For me and for most of you, if you have read Wally, Wally, the Disney Pixar movie, you will see that the movie subverts not only people or corporations that uh, exploit nature, but also they it questions the reality when the media, the corporations, the television, and so on control humans. It talks about people being controlled by these powers. And uh, another work, say 1984, uh, which one of you have read in, in extensive reading is also like that. It talks about a society in which the government has a total control over the, the, the citizens. The citizens cannot uh, turn their heads outside or cannot do something without the government seeing it. And another movie called The Minority Report not movie, actually it's a short story. Uh, the Minority Report is also about that. It's about uh, a society in which everyone is already registered. Everyone has, uh, has been ID'd. 
So no matter where you go, somebody will always know where you are. So that's what I want to end this um, presentation with. Now, what I want you to do is uh, for the presenting group, please prepare your presentation and uh, discuss the short stories that I gave you earlier uh, to discuss, to, 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 to talk about the idea of science fiction. And for those who, uh, for, for the audience, I also want you to read the short stories and engage in the discussion. I will give you another assignment towards the end of next week. As you know, uh, you have only done two big quizzes and uh, I will eventually have to give you a third big quiz, but it will not be like what we have planned in the work. It will be something else. Not we have planned in the syllabus, it will be something else because of the situation. Thank you very much and have a good weekend everyone. Bye.